All right. Hello. Welcome to our participants as we start uh, moving online here. Uh, this is our Cavia webinar today about how successful L&D teams work. Uh, we're going to give it just a minute uh, to allow folks to uh, get online once more. Uh, that said, uh, we do have a short poll uh, that you can fill out as we wait. So we're once more going to give it just one minute here. Uh, I'm Adam Smartin, the moderator and the host today, uh, joined by an awesome team from Cavio. Uh, we'll introduce uh, the panelists here in just one second. Just in case you haven't become more than accustomed to webinars here over the course of 2020, 2021, moving into 2022, uh, you are certainly able to ask questions at any point. Uh, you can raise your hand uh, if you like, especially for the panelists. Uh, but the Q&A uh, is down at the bottom right in the black bar on Zoom. Okay, so we are starting to get close to a quorum here in participants. Uh, we only have an hour, uh, so let's get moving. Uh, once more, I'm Adam, I'm your moderator today and your host uh, for this webinar uh, with the team from Cavio. Uh, we can go ahead and introduce uh, the tremendous talent that's here with us today. Uh, we're gonna start uh, with Tim Youngman. Uh, Tim is the directing uh, director, excuse me, of learning architecture. Uh, he has been a custom learning consultant for 25 years uh, with a master's of curriculum and instruction from the University of Houston, about 80 hours of doctoral study under his belt. Uh, moving on from there, uh, we have Molly Fisher. Uh, Molly is our senior instructional designer at Cavio with a master in education, uh, instructional design, and development from the University of South Florida. Uh, she's been the lead designer and developer for clients like McDonald's and Amazon, uh, so quite a bit coming from Molly's chair. Now, ne next up is our project manager extraordinaire, Paul Powell, the PMO director at Cavio. Uh, he's been managing global L&D projects for more than 20 years. We have Laura Riskus with us as well, our director of learning consulting at Cavio. She's waving there, thank you. Uh, she started her first venture into L&D more than 20 years ago. Uh, she's led global change management in initiatives for any number of Fortune 500 companies, hold certifications from ProSci and APMG. And last but certainly not least is Mitch Weiss, our VP of Client Services. Uh, he's a 20-year veteran of the industry uh, with a Doctor of Education in Instructional Technology. So thank you all uh, for being here. Thank you so, for having us. <laughs> thanks. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Great. So we're gonna dive in uh, into three parts uh, on this webinar. Uh, first, we're gonna cover instructional design. Uh, we're going to move on to learning consulting and project management, uh, the three legs of the stool, so to speak, uh, when building a high-performing L&D team. Uh, so with that in mind, Tim, I wanna direct the first question your way. Uh, how do you work uh, to guide clients uh, to reasonable expectations on design and learner experience? Yeah, you know, I think really it all comes down to um, early collaboration at the, uh, the beginning of the, uh, the project. And this is something that I have found, you know, through, through my years of experience is that when I can get all of the, uh, the subject matter experts and the stakeholders and our designers into one room, and we can uh, take some time to really brainstorm, you know, what the framework is going to be, do some um, whiteboarding of uh, some potential solutions, and then, you know, even show some, uh, some different types of uh, samples sort of working toward a mood board. That really allows us an opportunity to collaboratively, you know, um, design something together and really discuss all of the ideas. So that all of us walking out of that room have similar expectations about what it is that uh, that we're actually going to be producing. Okay. 
And in that production, uh, I'm, I'm sure that there's creativity on one hand, uh, and then there's scope and, and realistic uh, expectations on the other. Uh, how do you balance them? Yeah, you know, I think I was thinking about this. One of the things that um, I think is a misconception is uh, that creativity is more expensive. Um, and actually, that's that's not really the case. I think what we um, what we always strive to do is while we want to know exactly what the scope is, um, we want to think about uh, creativity within that uh, within that scope. So one of the examples I was thinking of, and this is really the best course that I re ever remember doing, it was a very low cost course. And we only used, um, we used pictures and um, on-screen text. It was an e-learning course, um, but we really focused on developing um, a very solid story that was compelling and had an emotional impact. And it took a lot of creativity to do it, but it wasn't really expensive. So, you know, in terms of balancing those things, I think, um, what you really have to do is you have to kind of think about, you know, you have to put your design thinking cap on and really think about, you know, what are the options that you have that are within the scope, but not let the scope limit your creativity. Interesting, interesting. And uh, Molly, I know you had some thoughts on how things are, are evolving, uh, innovation uh, and advances in L&D here in 2022 uh, and beyond uh, with regards to some of that creativity. Um, yeah, when I think about, you know, changes that could be coming in the future, um, I know that the needs of our learners are going to change over time um, as we just get new generations into the workforce, um, new different types of careers that we'll have to have training for, um, new or more effective technology, a deeper understanding of, um, you know, how to better engage our learners. Um, so, you know, trends in instructional design are always changing, um, collaborative tools, authoring tools, learning management systems are always changing. Um, but I think that the LND at its core, which I, I really feel is, um, you know, to provide our learners with the best outcome, that will always be the role of the LD team. So maybe the way that we do our work will change in the future, but I think that the, and the products would change, but I think that our core purpose will stand for a while. Interesting. And now, Mitch, uh, from your seat, you are one of the architects, uh, along with the Cavio team, uh, of the product, right? How do you get the whole client team, every stakeholder from the L&D side uh, to the C-suite on board? How do you get buy-in? That's a really good question, Adam. I think I think everybody, you know, on this call, including the Cavio team, is really bought in to having that that stakeholder team buy in. Not, not only on just a project level, but even at a, at a micro level. You know, you want to try some new types of of training, new types of e learning, and that type of thing. Uh, and it's important to to kind of bring them on board. And I I think the key word there is awareness, right? Um, Getting those stakeholders and communicating clearly with them, we use a process here at Cavio called A Squared, which kind of loops all of those important individuals in early on and working with them and communicating with them what's happening and, and almost working with them, not for them on the project and having them be a part of the team, taking their input and including it in the output it is really important. I think that sense of teamwork and that awareness of what's going on can really kind of help the situation there. Almost kind of flipping it, uh, you might offer an idea, but having having them almost believe that it's their idea that they're producing uh, because you've worked so collaboratively with them. And, and when they see that, they see it as more of a teamwork effort instead of an individual telling them what to do and they're, they're more willing to buy in. Awesome. And let's tease that out just a little bit. Uh, A squared, uh, it's, it's Addy and Agile coming together, correct? Yeah, that um, is uh, exactly right. So, uh, talk um, to, talk to we a little do, bit more how those play together. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think all of us have dabbled a little bit with with agile types of learning, uh, trying to get things out rapidly using things like sprints and and planning sessions. And uh, we've all probably been taught what 
Addy is, right? The, the, the traditional model. The model, like I mentioned that we use here as A squared, it's kind of a blend of both. So we've taken a little bit of the best of Addy and the best of Agile and turned it into a model that's really, really iterative and structured and kind of removes some of those uh, trouble spots, if you will, in the normal development process. Now, within that development process, uh, things things are going to change, right? There's always going to be last minute modifications. There's going to be the potential for rework. Uh, Tim, Laura, I, I know that you've done a, a lot here uh, trying to avoid that and trying to smooth out the process. I think um, one of the things, you know, you know, picking up on what Mitch said in terms of uh, the sprints, that's something that we really focus on a lot. Um, you know, uh, subject matter experts by their nature are very busy uh, people. And so what we try to do is we try to uh, develop uh, short snippets, um, you know, smaller pieces, smaller deliverables, and get uh, feedback and input um, as soon as possible in the process. Take that feedback and integrate it immediately. And then as we move to the next you know, a little bit of content, we kind of integrate that moving forward. So it's like continuously improving um, a product as you are actually in the development process. And, you know, for the subject matter experts that I work with, it's a lot easier for me to say, hey, can I take 15 minutes of your time to go through this than it is to say, can I take an hour and a half, two hours to kind of go through this big deliverable? So um, the sprints has really helped us a lot. Um, Laura, I'll let you add your bit. Yeah, uh, Tim, I agree. And I think that having a conversation early on about what type of potential competing initiatives or something that the team thinks that might create some last minute changes really proactively, um, it provides the team an ability to proactively plan if you can, for some of those things. And I think what Molly said too about, you know, really keeping the experience of the learner at the center of what you're doing. And when those, those last minute changes come up, really asking why is this important and how is this going to impact the learner's experience? And I think all of those are really good ways to manage those kind of last minute reworks. And I'm sure within the process, uh, there's always feedback uh, from the client, from stakeholders. And I'm sure, Molly, it's not always quite as clear uh, as it could be. Uh, how do you manage that? Um, well, we always try to minimize the subjective feedback or kind of vague feedback um, by telling the clients up front whenever we have any kind of deliverable for, a deliverable for them um, to provide us with actionable and consolidated feedback. But of course, we still get vague feedback sometimes. Um, so I think it's always important, just like Mitch said earlier, that we um, have a collaborative environment um, where we're all comfortable asking questions. So um, on any project, the rest of the L&D team has communication with the client about the project before I ever do. So they're really key in helping uh, create that uh, relationship of collaboration and, uh, you know, setting the tone so that I am able to handle like the feedback with them. Um, and then along with that, um, just always trying to reassure the clients that, um, you know, we want to give them a high quality product um, and we just need more information on certain points um, and just never be afraid to ask. Makes sense. Uh, now they ask, uh, sometimes I bet that ask is out of scope. Uh, Paul from the project management seat, uh, how do you deal with that? Um, well, I start by um, trying to not make out of scope requests equal to a bad request. I actually see those out of scope requests as potentially better information as we're moving through the project, right? Most people, most, right, I know most people who are listening here have gone on projects and you know that at the beginning you're doing a lot of estimating as you're moving through, you're getting better information. So one of the things I'll do when an out of scope request is raised is really look to the team. And this is where it goes back to an effective team. Um, in terms of giving me input on how much learner value there is potentially, um, is it a critical change, what type of effort will be involved, et cetera, as well as fact finding with um, whoever the client or stakeholder is to understand, right, why they want this change. Um, at the end of the day, right, I have to put some type of effort around it, 
decide, right, can we fit it without impacting budget and schedule? If we can, great. And it's right, the team has said this is a valuable change, we'll do it. If not, then we have to go ahead and talk about, right, does the client want to move forward with further investment for it? An interesting look, and it, it really speaks to uh, Cavio's way of doing business, uh, which is client first, uh, of course. Um, now, those clients, uh, back to you, Molly, uh, are going to make requests. Uh, to Paul's point, it needs to be learner focused. How do you keep uh, that uh, uh, that on track? Um, you know, everything goes back to that relationship of collaboration. Um, I think it's really imperative um, for both us and the LND team uh, to be able to meet the needs of uh, for the client and also for the client to be happy. Um, so whenever a client requests something that's not learner focused, um, it's important for us to act as a trusted advisor for them. Um, and we might need to have an honest conversation about why their request might not have any added value to the product. Um, or um, maybe we can get creative and think about how we can make their request uh, adjusted so that it does serve a purpose for the learners. So a uh, bit of compromise and listening to the client uh, is really key in facilitating that positive relationship throughout from beginning to end. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Uh, as a reminder to the audience, uh, we do have questions open down at the bottom right of that uh, black bar at the bottom of Zoom. Uh, we have a few flowing in. Uh, there's a question here about stakeholders and managers disagreeing. Uh, how do you guys manage that? I would say facilitate the conversation. So for anyone, right, we've all been in this situation, if, if not finding ourselves in this situation um, often. There's a, right, there's a conversation that needs to be had. I am going into the conversation, right, kind of revisiting the initial goals, but also thinking, right, where's the win-win? Um, I think the most important thing on a project in general is communication. And that's one of those high communication points. A lot of times, once you get into that conversation, what I find is that um, sometimes that uh, what the stakeholder and the manager are looking for aren't that as far off from each other as it seems to be. Um, so I'll look with, for where the compromise point is. Additionally, some of the right kind of project management logistical things that I do is try to determine the feasibility of potential um, outcomes or alternate solutions, right? Determine the risk for those, but really look and see what can we implement, right? How close are these two opinions? Really how close or far away are they? And then go ahead and negotiate towards some type of compromise and, and what we'll execute on. And I know Laura, Laura, that touches on uh, your area of expertise a bit too, right? It sure does, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I think that you know when you have those discussions about who's your sponsor and who is supporting, you know, the training and who is encouraging the messaging around whether it be participating in the training or the expectations around uh, creating that um, environment so that employees have the ability to implement and act upon the information that's in the training. All of that then, again, this kind of, I, I Molly's got a great theme because it really does go back to the learner and and making those decisions in best interest of the learner. So I 100% agree with Paul in that fact that having those conversations, uh, if you're not able to have them up front, but if they do surface, uh, to be able to get everybody in the room and have that discussion to make sure that um, everybody is going towards the same goal. Sometimes you do need to realign. That's just the way it is. And I would, I would, I would add yeah. to that as well. We try to be, right, and would always recommend being proactive rather than reactive. And it goes back to collaboration, right? This whole team mindset, we're not necessarily from the outset seeing the sponsors or high level stakeholders as outside the team, right? We're, we're not, when so when, right, a mismatch or risk or potential difference of opinions comes up, right? It's not necessarily the first time that we're bringing these folks together. They're part of the overall team that we wanna build a dynamic with that we can Right, kind of work together, collaborate, solve issues, et cetera. And Paul, there was one more, I, I think directed uh, at your answer previously. From a client perspective, 
even though uh, scope creep and out of scope requests aren't necessarily bad requests, uh, it is uh, incumbent to try to reduce them from a time perspective, from a cost perspective. Mm -hmm. how, how can a client think about this working with Cavio uh, to make sure that they are uh, aligned with you? I think, it, I think, again, it goes back to collaboration. I think the client has to really see themselves as a part of the project team. Um, we right, try to engage them in discussions around what the learner needs are, et cetera, as many conversations as, as we can. But I think from a client standpoint, it's really engaging. Um, throughout the project, we don't, right, just scope, discussions around scope just don't surface, you know, at different, at different points. We're talking about it throughout. So I think from a client standpoint, it's really staying engaged in those um, in those discussions throughout so that they're not, it doesn't sound like they're hearing anything new at any point in time. It's sort of just a part of the end-to-end -end cycle that we're engaged in. Fantastic, thank you, thank you. So from here, uh, I wanna move on to a, a discussion around learning uh, consulting. Uh, now, part of this uh, is the change management role. Laura, I know you are passionate about that. <laughs> I uh, am. <laughs> uh, it, it, tell us a bit about that, the, the change management, the change specialist. How can they really help drive a project, uh, meet a timeline, make everything more effective? Absolutely. I, I think that what's fantastic about being able to combine training and change is that um, there is so much power in preparing your learner for what the expectations are. And that can be done through very careful planning of messaging, reinforcing key messages, reinforcing even key concepts before the, the actual unquote training event occurs. Mm -hmm. Um, that is exceedingly helpful. And when it's planned, it feels very intentional and it's not like a big surprise when the trainer, when, you know, when they, when they come into the classroom or they experience the learning, however they're experiencing it. Um, I also think that by saying, Hey, we need to plan this ahead of time. We have dates that we need to make sure that we're preparing the learner that does push the team to make sure that they're hitting those milestones to deliver on the training as well. So I think it's a, you know, we talk about collaboration a lot, but it's very much of a team effort so that the training and the, or the, the, the change management, the communication is supporting the training environment. And I think it also does help to avoid certain things such as like I mentioned, what are competing initiatives? Um, you don't want your training, your, tr you know, your learners oversaturated either. So having a good idea of what's going on in the environment from a change mm -hmm. perspective allows you to deliver the training in the most effective time and means possible. Yeah. And, and, and on that note, Laura, I think, you know, you can have the world's greatest training. You can have the world's greatest training program. But if learners don't want to take it and they don't see what's in it for them, they're not going to want to take it. Uh, and I think, I think we've all, you know, everyone on this call, you know, uh, including the Caviar team has created a course that we thought was a great course and, and we put it out there and very few people took it, right? You know, the learners didn't see a benefit to them. And I think having those, the, that change management aspect to, to any type of program or course or anything you're putting together can really add incentive for learners to, to take that course and, and to see, well, if I take this, I'm going to do my job better and it's going to get easier. Or, you know, from a stakeholder standpoint, if more learners take this, it's going to save us some money. Uh, I just think it's important. I worked at an organization where, you know, we had about 30, 30 instructional designers and we had a dedicated team of six change managers and they were on every single project. Mm -hmm. And with every course yep. we put out, we made sure there was a strong communications plan. Mm -hmm. There was a strong change plan to get people vested in taking it uh, because we put such value in training. And I think even having, you know, not an individual, you know, a lot of organizations, you know, maybe can't afford or don't have the resources to put a change manager in there. You don't need that, right? An instructional designer or developer can just put, you know, together a small plan around, you know, why they should take it and a communications plan and something to create that incentive for taking it. So actually from the audience here, uh, pursuant, I, I think, to, to your point there, Laura, uh, is this dedicated change manager, this dedicated change specialist going to slow down the process? 
Absolutely not. I think that it, there's a, you have to right size what the change is for each project, right? So depending, if it is a big program, you're going to be putting a lot of time and effort into developing the training that goes into that program. So you want to make sure that you're getting your return on investment. Very basic plans, such as Mitch mentioned, communication plans up front, alignment with the stakeholder, and even proving what that the that the training was effective. Um, if you look at it from a long-term perspective and you look at it from the perspective of the learning, the learning organization, it provides a, an ability to show the value of the learning to the business. So it's not just about checking the box or getting people to training. It's about how was the impact of the training and the learning on the achieving business goals. So you do have to right size it though. So you don't want to put like a huge communication plan um, on top of, you know, maybe a two hour e-learning course, but it might be a good idea to kind of be able to connect maybe a series of e-learning courses that are coming out and connecting the meaning between each of those. And as Mitch mentioned, what's in it for them? That's, that is one communication and that is, that's relatively minor, but taking that little additional step makes a big difference. So I would definitely right size it for sure. Yeah, and I think even, you know, some of those communications can uh, can help build, you know, some um, some curiosity and mm -hmm. some enthusiasm for the uh, for the training that uh, that is uh, to come, especially if it's a larger initiative. Um, I think there's um, a lot you can do in terms of um, you know, building that curiosity. I always like to do like these little webisodes or something that, you know, is like a continuing kind of series that kind of leads up to the training. So, you know, you know, you're kind of building enthusiasm because we recognize that, you know, anytime we are doing any type of training, we're really actually doing a change management process because fundamentally training is change management. We want people to do something a little bit differently. Um, we want people to think about something uh, differently or we want them to, to act differently. And so because of that, we really do have to employ the, uh, the practices of uh, change management whenever we think about designing a training program. Uh, now, within that program, uh, within that development process, is there a single most important piece uh, to get things done on time, on budget, and fantastic? Well, I, I, I'll, you know, I know Paul has spoken to this a lot, but um, it really is about alignment and continuous uh, collaboration. Uh, we really make sure that uh, both in the consulting process that we use and a, a squared, we are continuously aligning and collaborating with our folks, we're, with our clients. We're, we've had clients who said, I've learned so much from this from you, which is what I love about the learning part of Cavio Learning is that it's not just about creating training for learners, but it's also helping our clients learn how to work, whether it be differently or what have you. So when you make sure that you're on time and on budget, you're continuously in, everybody knows what's going on. There's no big surprises and there's nothing going on. And what we do is in the, in, in our side of the fence, we do what's called a blueprint and we ensure that the tactics and the blueprint are all aligned as we go through. Are there gonna be changes? There might be because there might be some changes in the environment itself, uh, but we make sure that all of us are always continuously communicating and aligning. And we make sure that we also say, how do we want to communicate? You can, we, we like to build these relationships so we can communicate outside of what we call regular meetings, right? So if, the, if they need to pick up the phone or we need to pick up the phone, we're familiar enough with each other that we can call each other and be very frank and honest. Um, and I think that helps so much uh, to meet the time, the budget, and um, and really have some a positive experience. Oh, I would agree. And to Laura's point, right, in, in terms of effective communication, we have, using A squared, we have built into the process, right, formal communication points. So if we're doing, um, if we're running sprints, right, we may have our standups. If it's you know a more traditional project, we may have our weekly statuses, but other project um, management tools, 
um, the project kickoff, uh, internal uh, alignments, the technology that we use. I would rec we use all of those, and I would re recommend for all folks on L and D project teams to use all of them and then some. You cannot over communicate, and you can't um, you can't underestimate how closely that is tied to right being able to hit those marks of on time, um, on budget, right within yeah, the schedule yeah. that was that was outlined and 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 right projects are right change is a part of a part of projects it has to be it has to be managed but the communication around that um, is is critical and when you get to the end no one should be feeling like right there was some change that happened that they weren't aware of or a part of or you hadn't worked through together but taking advantage of all those communication tools um, absolutely see now you can understand why I feel like uh, a, a change management leads best friend as a project manager. Thank you, Paul. And I would agree. <laughs> I, I, would, I would agree. I think that, yeah. As a long time PM, the change management piece is probably one of my, in recent years, most well understood pieces of the puzzle that most folks miss. So going back to the, the Q&A, uh, once more, it is open. Uh, we have a couple of questions here dealing with the previous portion on instructional design. Um, Tim, I, I think this is probably in your wheelhouse. Uh, we had a question about SME time commitments, right? These folks do not have hours and hours. I know you mentioned uh, 15 minutes versus an hour of time. How do you even get that 15 minutes uh, from someone who's very busy? You know, I think, you know, some of that really comes to, um, you know, I do go back to the collaborative design session, but I also, you know, think, um, you know, we have to um, set the expectation that that initially it's really important that we get uh, we get the input um, to really design a creative uh, solution um, because our instructional designers, while we're not uh, subject matter experts and we will never proclaim to be, you know, we'll do as much research as we possibly can before we even engage with a subject matter expert so that we know as much as we can about any source content that's provided and come in ready to ask questions. And, you know, when I talk about a collaborative design session, you know, one of the things that, uh, that we do as a common practice is kind of a, uh, well, we do mind mapping, but we'll always do a mind map that is sort of like an initial mind map. And we do that because otherwise, you know, you're kind of going in with a blank sheet of paper and there's nothing more intimidating than a blank sheet of paper and where do we start? So that initial mind map, even though I know that there's going to be information in there that's not right, that allows me to quickly engage the, uh, the subject matter experts. And once I get that input, um, you know, from the beginning, based on the research that I've already done, I think it makes it a lot easier through the process to kind of do those quick check-ins. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Tim. And you, you kind of touched on all the elements without saying it, but that's kind of the A squared model, what, what, what you described there. Uh, I think I think when we created that as a team here at Cavio, one of the things was SME time, right? That's something we, we really took into account. Uh, you know, sometimes we get too much SME time, you know, when they're all over a project and sometimes we can't get enough of their time and we realize it's valuable to them. So when you do get them at those critical junctures, you know, those design sessions and those uh, alignment meetings and things like that, use that time wisely, right? Because you may not have it in the future. So we strategically placed you know, points within the process where, you know, we'll, we'll take 10 minutes here, 15 minutes here. And, and depending on the SME, they may not have that. So we'll have to kind of, you know, adjust and adapt. But uh, the process that we do use kind of really maximizes any time that we do get with them. And that's important to do on, on your end as well. And Mitch, I think one of the examples of that too is also, right, doing those live, sometimes doing live SME reviews Right, and whatever time we can get, we want to maximize the output of that time. We want to use it in the most effective way. And I say, right, just quickly and simply that live sessions um, help a lot. Absolutely. I mean, there's a number of times where if we're sitting with a subject matter expert and you know we're doing an e-learning course, for example, 
you know, we'll break open, you know, storyline and start, uh, you know, exactly. updating and uh, making changes right there so that the, uh, the subject matter experts can uh, see them right on the spot. Um, we're not afraid to do that. And in fact, we like to do that um, mm -hmm. so that uh, so that we know, you know, that we're headed in the right direction, which is what it's all about. So a, a related question that, that just popped in, uh, what if the instructional, de instructional designer uh, doesn't necessarily want to know about the subject matter? What if they're not engaging with the subject matter experts in the research? Um, from an instructional designer myself, I, uh, I think that it's imperative for an instructional designer to understand the content because the content is going to drive the design. And um, if your instructional designer does not want to engage with the content, I don't know how they would be able to make an effective course, to be honest with you. Um, it, uh, content is above everything. So if they don't understand the content, um, I'm, I'm not sure that an effective course would be your final product. One thing that, you know, I, that I do as a tactic, you know, as a designer is um, I have to find, I always have to find the hook for myself as a designer and why I'm interested in the, uh, the topic. So, you know, at the surface level, I may not necessarily be, you know, interested in it initially, but I have to find that hook for myself. And when I find that hook, then I want to start to learn more about it as well. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time to find that hook, but once I find it, I'm ready to go. Uh, one other question here related to instructional design, uh, and I think Molly, this is probably uh, your seat. Um, what do you do if what you're being asked for explicitly uh, isn't the right solution? Um, what I love about instructional design is that there are infinite solutions um, for our clients. So uh, if I if my initial reaction is that something isn't the right solution, I take some time to consider um, why so that I can communicate that to our clients. Um, you know, always looking for the purpose that um, whatever is being asked, what does it serve for our learners? Um, I evaluate whatever solution is proposed against the learner's needs and then um, try to find a solution. Uh, can we incorporate it in some way, but just make it uh, some small adjustments here and there uh, to make it more aligned to our content or um, for whatever uh, our, um, our medium is for the course or the learning. Um, so, you know, if, if I'm asked for something that I don't think is the right solution, um, I would just always try to find that solution uh, that would make everybody happy um, with my PM and my LSA. Back to communication always uh, being key with any of these projects um, so that we can achieve the learning goals in the most um, effective way. Yeah, Molly makes a great point there. And I think in those particular situations, flexibility is key. I think, I think everybody has the same destination, right? You know, in a project, everyone wants quality training put out that that makes you know learners better at their job some people take different routes to that destination some people might take a back road some people might take the highway some people take an airplane or a helicopter or a train uh there's different ways to get to that destination and none of them are necessarily wrong right and and sometimes as, as designers uh, uh to be honest with you we need to let it go Right, you know, sometimes we get stuck on our own designs and we say, well, this is the only way to do it. But sometimes we lose that vision that, that other bring, people bring to the table. So think think flexible and, and kind of really listen to what people are saying because there's definitely value in what they add. They're just thinking differently than you are. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, we do wanna move on uh, to project management here as we get uh, closer to the top of the hour. Uh, once more, reminder, Q&A is open. Uh, we will try to answer everything live. If we can't get to you today, we'll be sure to send you an email uh, with the specific answer uh, ASAP. Uh, so, Paul, I uh, want to turn to you here. Uh, one thing I'm curious about is misconceptions about the PM role. I don't know that everyone quite understands exactly uh, everything and how a PM does it. I think the probably the biggest misconception is that the project manager is leading the L&D project team versus facilitating and empowering the L&D project team, um, right? Kind of current, and I don't know how many 
PMs we actually have on the line, but a lot of um, current project management methodologies, and especially under Agile, believe that the best way to get to the end product is to get, essentially to get the right people together, um, right? help them focus and facilitate, empower and facilitate them. So I think that's the biggest misconception. Sometimes, right, the traditional model looks like the PM has the budget, the PM runs the schedule, the PM's the one who's, right, knocking on your door in the middle of the night to get you to complete the, the task. There's some of that in terms of, of facilitation, but essentially what the PM should be doing is empowering the team. I try to think not only about the full team and empowering them, I look at the individuals, right, from the client side and from the Cavio side, what are some of their needs, where are opportunities, um, you know, how can I get, the, if I identify something that they, that they're really good at doing, how I can get that particular task, you know, to get them involved with it. But I think the biggest misconception is that, right, we're just kind of leading and pushing the team rather than facilitating and empowering. So a, a question from the audience just now, uh, how do you empower the team? How, how do you imbue them with, uh, with what they need to succeed? Um, one of the things, and this may sound like a, a soft thing to do, but I, I sort of just spoke about it and it, right, I'm involved in doing this on a daily basis. Um, enabling the project team members to make decisions, right? So a typical decision that might come to me um, I, it could be simple. Yeah, you know, it could be something as simple as can we, you know, increase the audio by one one minute, um, right? I want the I want my team. I want to respond to my team member that comes to me with that sort of question in such a way as to know that they are empowered to make that decision. So rather than just giving them an answer, sometimes I'll often respond and ask, well, what's the value of that, or what do you think? Um, right, but trying to build the team up and the individual team members. Also, from a collaborative standpoint, I try to include um, all roles on the team in as much decision making as possible. I don't make unilateral decisions, um, even about budget and, and scope. It's involving the team. And one of the other things that I do, um, typically at the beginning of a project, is I'll say these things that I'm saying right now. Right? I'll speak to the, clean, to the team saying, we are a whole team. Right, we're all responsible. How can we work together to manage scope throughout the life of the project, et cetera? I, I hope that answers the question. Those are examples. I think so. I think so. Um, so, within that life of the project, uh, are there specific steps uh, that are most important? Um, from my standpoint, uh, particularly under our A squared process, we call it cycle planning. Um, under Agile, it might be referred to as. Um, uh, retrospective sometimes, um, but it's these touch points in the process where we stop right at the end of a phase or after we've produced a deliverable and we ask a few key questions. And our questions aren't limited to these, but some of the key questions are, right, kind of how, how are we doing essentially, right, in terms of what we're producing, what worked, what didn't work, what do we need to change? And then we'll agree, we'll talk through solutions, agree, align on what needs to change and then move forward. So to me, that cycle planning, right? Those retrospectives between phases or right after a deliverable are critical because it prevents us from, you know, continuing downstream, um, doing things in a, in a way that's less than optimal and not as efficient or not working for the full team. And sometimes it might just be communication. Sometimes it might be something about right, the alpha course we're producing or, you know, how much of an alpha we're producing. Um, but having that, those cycle planning discussions, I think are, are, are I think that they're, they're, they're critical. They, they, there's a lot of efficiencies to be found by doing that. Um, no. I just want, I'm oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I just wanted to add in there, Paul, um, that I agree that those, um, those points are uh, invaluable whenever we're um, developing any kind of project. Um, but for me, I would say that the most important part is our first part of A squared, which is the um, defining the need and identifying the solution so that um, 
we can go through our design workshop and our first look presentation um, so that I'm able to design and develop a project that meets the needs as we go through the alpha, the beta, the final, and the rest of the A squared project. Um, so, you know, we look at the objectives and the learner personas and um, the ideal outcomes that our clients are looking for. Um, and from that, I can work with the clients and then the LD team uh, to make decisions and create a holistic solution so that we can have those conversations um, later on down the road. Um, and that it's all in line with what they were already expecting. So conversations and communication, Laura, right? So key. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, for all of this to happen and to happen in a way that is really honest, really has to do with how we view our clients. And we view our clients as partners. We really view them as we're, we we pride ourselves on the relationships that we build and that it's it goes beyond just hey, we want to make sure we're doing a great job for you. But uh, by the way, how is your kid doing, right? Like it's it's building, we're all working eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day. We want to be able to build those relationships with people because we want to be able to understand and empathize with them. And our clients, when we work, it's not just about, hey, it's all about business, right? We want to make sure that we're understanding where they're coming from as well, because when they do have challenges, then we understand where they're coming from. So um, being able to build that, that, that communication and that relationship with them is one of our most important values here at Cavio, no doubt about it. I mean, it's making those connections with people um, to whether you have that one moment during the day where you're like, oh my gosh, we all did something great. Or um, having that at the end of the, the project, looking back and going, wow, that was a fantastic experience. That's always what we aim for. So question coming in from the audience here uh, around optimizing iterations. Uh, how do we make sure that the uh, development process is as fast uh, and frankly, as agile as it could possibly be? I didn't know if Tim wanted to take that. <laughs> or I... Either one of us. I mean, you know, from, from my perspective, you know, I think, um, you know, it goes back to uh, producing, you know, a small amount, getting, uh, getting that, uh, that feedback, perhaps jumping on the call and making uh, changes real time, and then uh, continuing forward. Um, you know, I think the, uh, the thing that, you know, the, the way I was raised, <laughs> you know, we would do, uh, you know, we would do these long, huge, comprehensive storyboards. And, you know, it would take us forever to do them and then we'd send them out. And I swear half the time people didn't actually read them anyways, but, you know, then we would go and develop and there would be like this complete mismatch. And that's what we want to avoid. So, you know, we want to get as close to, you know, something that is um, a polished um, prototype as soon as possible in the process, you know, right after, you know, that design session, that first look uh, presentation. So that we're all building from that uh, polished prototype moving forward. And we have a sense of what the end is going to look like. And I think that that prototyping phase is really critical to the uh, outcome of the overall project. I hope and I, I answered I, the question. <laughs> I, no, I, and I agree with Tim and was thinking the same thing, right? So there's, you really can't beat um, in person, working together, collaboration. But we live in a virtual, right, kind of matrix, um, you know, in different locations, et cetera. But still being able to have live sessions where you have um, as many of the critical roles, whether it's subject matter, experts, managers of the decision makers, or the developer at the table, where you can actually work together. Um, and implement changes um, or up, updates or what have you on the spot. But as close as you can get to that live environment, that would be the recommendation. We did a project here, uh, gosh, I think it's about a year ago for a client. Um, and we literally cut the design and development time in half from the original estimate by 50% just by having sessions where we work together 
um, often, almost daily, and we had the developer and subject matter experts, project manager, managers in the room on the line together. And right, storyline was open and we were moving it. And the, out, the product was outstanding. Yeah, and I just wanted to add one more thing to that because when you do cons when you collaborate and you include the change related questions and analysis with the training, um, you can really get your bang for your buck. So you're talking about addressing not just be not just the knowledge gaps, but the behaviors that you're expecting to you know to impact, um, and you can do that in one fell swoop. And then as we're working together, as we collaborate together, you have both. Of those teams working together, one with the change side, one in the training side, and they're working in parallel with each other. So one isn't waiting on the other. Um, and that really does help to push a lot of things along. I think, and I think too often we see those things as separate or we see roles as separate. Sure. We have to work to bring, right, those different components together. And I think as L&D project team members, we just have to accept that from the outset, that these roles, these mm -hmm. right kind of what we would see as the old school lanes of getting this work done, they're a lot closer than we think. And so sometimes we'll have a feeling that, well, if we you know, bring this person into this session or this meeting or this communication, right, we're going to be wasting their time when actually it's not the case at, at all. They really do need to, to be there. And I would, I would dare say you're, you're going to get efficiencies from that as you move throughout the process. So coming from the audience here, uh, is there a risk uh, with an incomplete prototype or an incomplete uh, MVP uh, version uh, of a project of uh, confusing stakeholders, right? How do we set those expectations that this isn't necessarily the finished product and here's where it's going? Yeah, I think I think Paul and 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 Tim usually set those expectations early on. And here at Caveat, we we have the benefit of having, uh, you know, a proposal cycle where we go to clients and they can they can see all this. But early on, I know that we actually present to them and we say, this is what you'll get when here and this is what it's going to look like. So that they know when you come to that prototype stage, that, that prototype stage is going to be uh, a prototype and not a, not a finished product. So I think I think it's really important early on just not only to set you know, expectations about what they'll get, but set the entire framework. Talk yep. about when you're going to have those alignment meetings, those purposes of those alignment meetings, the design sessions, whatever you're working on, mm -hmm. just lay it out all at the beginning. And it's sort of like a roadmap, you know, show them how you're going to get from concept to completion. And that way they know what they're getting when. Uh, and that's a key point. And I think that a lot, a lot of organizations kind of forget to do that, right? And, and the question is interesting because someone will get a prototype and go, that's not quite the training I thought it was going to be. But there's still a lot more work to be done. And if you set those early on, you can avoid that confusion. Yeah, yes. agreed. Go ahead, Molly. I was just going to add on that um, from the developer side, um, whenever there's something missing, like a certain design or features um, in the project, um, you know, we always make sure to communicate that this will be in there later, or this is just, uh, you know, this is mm -hmm. missing, this is missing, but you'll see that in your next right. iteration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and having somebody in the business who's an advocate for you um, as you're doing that so that they are the ones who are saying, yeah, no, I know we're, we're definitely going to get there, but this is where we're at right now. So you have a voice from the other side of the table, so to speak, to advocate for you on this too. Uh, so Mitch, you uh, mentioned concept to completion. Uh, that's the course itself. Uh, now for the learner, right, obviously, how well they do with the course and how they absorb the information speaks directly to business results. Uh, how do you recommend measuring that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Again, early on, right? Uh, every training has uh, an expected result. So for example, mm -hmm. if uh, you're doing an onboarding program, you want that person to exit that onboarding program and be able to do their job within 30, 60, 90 days, whatever that, that measurement is. When you define those measurements early on, it's much, much easier later on in the process to be able to measure them, right? If you don't do it and you go back, it's kind of having to rewrite some of the training, make sure that that training is focused on those particular elements, making sure that those objectives are being met. It's really important. And those of us that know instructional design, create those measurements. From those measurements, create objectives. From those objectives, create course elements. 
-hmm. And then you can easily measure those through, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, level one examinations or level two uh, evaluations or whatever you need to do. But I think the key there is really asking those hard questions of those stakeholders early on. What do you want out of this program, right? What what's success look like to you? What's the goal of this whole thing? What do you what do you want out of it? And then kind of filtering that down throughout the entire program. Yeah, and to Mitch's to build on Mitch's point, you know, saying okay, so if they are successful in doing what you want out of this, how is this going to impact your business goals? So right. you can even take it a step higher, understanding the training is only one of many of the aspects that might be able to impact business goals, but then being able to provide a little bit of understanding as to how much of it will impact it. And you can get down to a, a monetary amount of it's, how much training can yes. impact business goals. And we've done that with a couple of our clients and it becomes a very powerful conversation. And that is a great way to get manager support, leadership support for any of your training initiatives. And then they start to expect that, which is great because then they know that they're asking for training that will be meaningful to the business. Yeah, that elusive uh, return on investment is not mm -hmm. so elusive if, mm -hmm. if you listen to Laura. Um, <laughs> always listen to Laura. <laughs> always listen to Laura. It's true. And with a lot of our clients, we, we've kind of proven that there's ROI, and it's 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 on a on a high le stakeholder level. That's really impressive because instead of training being a cost, it almost becomes a a, a benefit, yeah, right? Yeah. A value add to the organization, and, and that's important. That's, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And that's a great place uh, to wrap up here as we get toward the top of the hour. Make sure everyone can get to their two o'clocks, one o'clock, whatever it happens to be in your particular time zone. Uh, once more, I want to thank all our panelists for joining us here for a great discussion. Thanks to a great audience, uh, super proactive here and, and super uh, involved in the conversation. Uh, we will be sending out a recording of this uh, just as soon as we can. Uh, beyond that, if you want to learn more, check out Cavio, C-A-V-E-O dot com. Uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you all so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.